these are just a few cases. There are other challenges which are to specific regulations and things like that. But clearly, there's a lot of courts that are going to be busy determining the lawfulness uh, in different ways of the regulatory environment for the Disaster Act. And since this disaster is going to go on for a long time, probably until there's a vaccine for the virus, these cases being brought now are clearly going to have a very uh, big impact on what our government is permitted to do and is not permitted to do uh, continuing. The applicants in this case, the Esau case, are a bunch of people that look, or I don't know how they're actually connected because they don't say, but they are ordinary people who are students, uh, working people. Uh, Dwayne Esau, who's the first applicant, is a student at the University of Cape Town. Um, what they are doing is that they are bringing a challenge to the constitutionality of the disaster regulations as a whole, and also alternatively to specific regulations. And they make arguments to do with both of them. Um, they say that many of the regulations can't be justified uh, in terms of uh, the human rights in the constitution and as limitations of rights, but also that they bear no rational link to fighting COVID-19 and, and stifle human rights in the process. So um, they also raise some concerns about the non-transparency or they say the opacity of the decision in the enactment of these uh, regulations. And they say that this is contradictory to the founding values of the constitution. This is important for the administrative law context because they're calling on openness, transparency, and accountability as founding values. And this connects to what we often talk about in administrative law, which is the culture of, of justification, which the constitution is supposed to provide as opposed to a culture of authority. So to begin with, uh, they uh, say that for the overall challenge, um, and this has been in the news for other reasons, they, they're worried about the command council, that of, which is made up of members, a certain number of members of cabinet, who are determining how we respond to COVID and how we move from one alert level to another. And their problem with this fundamentally is that they say that it's unlawful because the Disaster Management Act creates a national command center, a disaster center, that is supposed to be the entity that is uh, ensuring the administration and the dealing with and, and assisting in the declaration of national disasters. And because parliament has set this up, they are saying that this is unlawful to create a command council uh, within the executive, which excludes many members of cabinet and usurps the function of this command, this disaster command center, which is supposed to exist. And so that is a lawfulness problem. They don't say specifically, but they also challenge the rationality and what they call the fairness of many of the regulations. And when they say fairness, I am assuming they're going to argue based on procedural fairness, or it may just be participation uh, in the process, but they're talking about failure to consult. So it's not crystal clear what, they, what they're saying there. On lawfulness, they also say that uh, the Disaster Management Act requires, and as we put up in Section 26, that regulations can only be made to the extent necessary. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't matter on what topics. And they say that many of these, ne these regulations are, are not necessary to be made because they uh, deal with all manner of things. In many of the papers of these court cases, and also on social media, you will see that the ones that are very easy to make fun of uh, are the ones like the Minister of Trade and Industries directions, which say that you can only buy winter clothing and that that means that you can only buy t-shirts, for example, if they're for the purpose of wearing under warmer tops, right? And so they say that this is obviously not necessary, like many of the things, and therefore uh, the, this is an unlawful set of regulations. The problematic regulations that they highlight the most, though, as a general matter, they seem very concerned with particularly um, the curfew and movement regulations. Uh, they make similar arguments to the Democratic Alliance, as we'll, as we'll see, and the restrictions on which businesses can trade and which cannot trade. As with the, um, with, with the Democratic Alliance, they argue directly that the standards of review exist in terms of PAJA. And they say that the decisions must be lawful, reasonable, and procedurally fair. But maybe because they're also worried about a court determining that this is executive action and not administrative action, which I don't think is likely, but they're worried about it. They rely mostly on the fact that they say that the, that the regulations or certain regulations are irrational. 
And so they, they say, for example, that they're irrational, but they're also unjustifiable limitations of rights. And the examples are, they say there's no evidence that the distance from your home affects the risk of transmission of COVID. Mm -hmm. So if you can only go five kilometers away from your home for exercise, or if you go far away for something else, if you're outside, then you're risking transmission to you or someone else of COVID, and it's not rational to prevent how far. They say that there's no evidence that there's any more risk of transmission when you're buying goods that are permitted, essential goods, and non-essential goods. So they say, if you're in a shop, if you go to pick and pay, and you want to buy a tennis ball, and you want to buy a loaf of bread, and you want to do them both at the same time, you have not increased the risk of transmission because you went and bought the tennis ball. So pick and pay should be able to sell the tennis ball. This is just not rational in, in their view. Also, there are certain things like it's not permitted to sell hot food um, in certain places except for, for uh, delivery. And uh, there's no difference in the risk of transmission if pick and pay sells hot food instead of cold food. Um, or if uh, someone is selling non-educational books instead of educational books, and at some stage only educational books were allowed to be sold. So they're basically saying that these are irrational. They make the same point about the difference in running at nine and running at 901. And I'm sure that all of us have, who have tried to brave the cold to run uh, have had the fear of leaving at 8.30 and being one minute late on our run and then breaking the law uh, and can see the funny side of that irrationality. Um, and then they also say uh, that the curfew, uh, there is no difference between our ability to transmit the disease at, at night and at day. So there's no, and one of the problems that people have raised with this publicly, which I think is quite right, is even if there's a rational reason for many of these measures, including the curfew, that certainly hasn't been told to us. So this is one of the major uh, strings in the bow of people arguing that it's irrational. Then on the unjustifiable limitation of rights, and they mentioned dignity, freedom of movement, all of the rights you can imagine, they say that there's quite obviously less restrictive means that could be employed to uh, achieve the same effects. So that's the Esau case. They, they're not looking for um, the regulations to be completely thrown out. They want, they're, they're concerned, uh, as you mentioned, Melanie, in the first DA case with what would happen if there was this gap. So they say that uh, they are okay with the declaration that it's unconstitutional and a suspension of that declaration until uh, these regulations or the regulations in general can be fixed to be compliant with the constitution. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if there's anything that you wanted to pick up on that case. Um, I think you covered it quite comprehensively. Um, I think the one of the nice differences is they, they have done this limitations analysis quite quite well, and that, that shows the, the, the nature and extent of the limitations of, of rights. Um, and I think that that's quite important. I think it's, it's useful to, to note that if the uh, conduct under scrutiny isn't administrative action, it will be harder for ESO and others to argue that there should be uh, proper public participation before the, the regulations were brought into place. So that's one of the big differences between um, legality, uh, the standards of legality and the standards of of um, Hydra and Section 33 of the Constitution is that when um, conduct is administrative action, it must be fair uh, in terms of Section 33 of the Constitution. So it must be uh, done according to a fair procedure. And so that means that at least uh, one of the procedures provided for in Section 4 of Hydra should have been followed, which would be notice and comment procedure. Um, and would or, or a public inquiry or both of those or another fair but different procedure and um, if one of those procedures wasn't followed then the conduct could be reviewed and set aside as being unfair um, in terms of section 62c of Pudger and so that's kind of um, an important implication of the conduct being administrative action or not is that people can then insist on that standard of fairness being upheld, where if the conduct is administrative action, where if it's not, they can only ask for consultation to the extent that it would be irrational for the ministers not to have consulted. So that's not the same kind of consultation obligation if 
the conduct is executive action a subject only to the standards of legality. So in that scenario, the ministers are only required to um, act lawfully and rationally, but rationality can to some degree require uh, a consultation where it would be irrational not to consult. And that's a much lesser requirement of fairness than what is expected under section 33. So, and I think that we'll see uh, this uh, tension also with consultation and participation in the next case. Yeah. So part of, part of the whether, part of the conclusion of whether or not it would be rational or irrational to not consult will depend on how long uh, the ministers have to undertake their task. And what we're seeing is that in the start, a lot of people might have not been opposed to not being consulted or not having long discussions before a lockdown was declared, but now we're a few months in and we could be looking at many more months or a year of the same type of, type, same type of situation and people are starting to question, well, if there's so much time, why is there no opportunity to consult? Um, the last case is being brought by Helen Sussman Foundation, and this one has been brought directly to the Constitutional Court too, um, like the first Democratic Alliance case that we discussed. So the Helen Sussman Foundation is a, is an, is a not-for-profit uh, could say NGO or think tank that espouses and supports a liberal constitutional democracy. And um, the Helen Sussman Foundation case has some similarities to that first DA case, but it is also fundamentally different and it deliberately tries to distinguish itself from the DA case. So in the start, the Helen Sussman Foundation uh, uh, founding affidavit says that this case is about the, how the state is regulating the disaster, not what it's regulating and why. So it doesn't, like Esau and the second High Court DA case, go into the substance of particular lockdown regulations, except for to say that clearly these regulations have an impact on constitutional rights. They give a long list of the constitutional rights. Their qualm is with how uh, the action is taken. And to begin with, in the start, they say that parliament and cabinet as a whole, so outside of the National Command Council, have essentially been missing in action. Um, that most of the government, most of the states and the two major branches of the government have been missing in action. So they allege that there's a failure of the executive to initiate a legislative process. And so in terms of section 85 of the constitution, the executive is supposed to uh, initiate the legislative process and prepare legislation for discussion in parliament and potential enactment. And then they say that there's a failure of parliament to enact legislation. And the legislation that they're conceiving of is legislation as has been passed in several other countries and they give examples. So legislation dealing directly with COVID-19, not a disaster management act, but something which is specific and really tailored towards the situation um, because the situation might go on for a long time and require a specific treatment. And neither the executive nor parliament have done this and they've, they are making an argument here, and I'll explain how they get there constitutionally later, that this is unconstitutional. They say that essentially what's been happening is that the executive has been acting unilaterally in terms of Section 27 of the Disaster Act. So uh, this could be for months and years, and, it, and according to the Helen Sussman Foundation, they uh, perceive the government and the executive in particular to think that it's okay for this situation of the executive acting unilaterally uh, to continue. For this period of time and then they list that this results in the violation of founding values of the constitution include including openness transparency accountability separation of powers uh principles all of these types of things as well as constitutional rights which are all the rights that are limited in the intervening time so their argument is that they look at the disaster management act and they say that the disaster management act uh, should only be allowed to prevail and is only intended and purpose to apply, set up to apply in the interim while the executive and the legislature find a way to react to more permanent disasters. If you had a, a disaster like an earthquake or something very quick that happened, then you'd react to it and then the Disaster Management Act is enough, everything is dealt with and everything goes away. Mm -hmm. But in the instance of a disaster like this, which is ongoing and probably for a long time, they say that in terms of the constitution and in terms of a purposive interpretation of the Disaster Management Act, 
the act cannot be considered to apply indefinitely or for very long periods of time. As quickly as the executive and the legislature can allow for an intervention through parliament, they should. Um, then in distinguishing themselves bet between the DA, and this is quite important for their case, they say that the Democratic Alliance in its application to the Constitutional Court says that this is an that, that what has happened is an impermissible delegation of power between the legislature and the executive. And that and, and they disagree with this, saying that it's more than that. It's an abdication of power, not a delegation. Nothing's been delegated. Parliament is simply gone, missing in action, as it says there. Uh, they haven't tried to do anything. And in fact, they quote statements from Parliament saying that they don't really have a role and the executive must take control. Um, they say that the DA's relief does not remedy the problem, the actual constitutional defect. And why do they say that? The DA wants uh, items read into the act which allow for uh, parliament to approve of or disagree with existing regulations and to be a part of it. But the real problem that they identify is that in this instance, it would still be the case that the executive is the one who's considered to be taking the lead and the executive is the one that has to respond and the executive is the one with the authority to do that. But in their interpretation, it's parliament who should be taking the lead in this. And therefore, this abdication of power would still be there regardless of whether or not you interpret in a role for parliament in what is essentially an executive function. So the DA is asking for parliamentary oversight and the HFS is, HSF is saying that there's, there's only a temporary need for parliamentary oversight until the executive can no longer be permissibly delegated any of the ordinary functions of parliament. Mm -hmm. So simply put, parliament and the executive can't sit on their hands and let the extraordinary, so executive power expansion, become ordinary. Now, where do they find the legal basis for saying that parliament must en enact legislation? They use, they, they call on a case called, and they cite a case called Glenister. Um, and in Glenister, the court said that the failure to enact legislation, specific legislation relating to corruption, uh, violated Section 7.2 of the Constitution, which requires the state to respect, protect, promote, and fulfill the rights in the Bill of Rights. And they say here that the unique and deleterious effect on human rights and on uh, 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 constitutional values of not passing this legislation and the violation of separation of powers too results then in uh, similarly in this case uh, there being a violation of that duty in terms of section 72 of the constitution so what they ask for is a declaration that parliament and executive have failed in their constitutional duties in terms of section 72 in failing to uh, respectively initiate and prepare legislation and then enact legislation and they ask for an order requiring cabinet to prepare and initiate legislation and parliament to pass legislation um, and they also then say that the, that, they, that the executive powers in terms of the Disaster Act should be ordered that those powers lapse simultaneously with the passing of legislation. So their argument is one that's fundamentally based on the separation of powers and fundamentally based on, as I said in the start, how it is that we achieve the regulation. And they're very careful not to impugn or criticize any of the different specific directions and regulations even though they might have a problem with them. They are simply saying that we cannot allow for the executive to take over functions of parliament in anything more than a temporary capacity. And the Disaster Management Act, according to them, doesn't need to be uh, revised or read in, like the DA argues. They say that the Disaster Management Act is simply needs to be read in a way that it simply doesn't allow for the endless uh, violation of the separation of powers in this way. So this case is much more about the relationship between the legislature and, and the executive, um, but it's not, um, it's not saying that um, the executive has acted sort of beyond its powers so much as it's saying um, they have, the parliament hasn't done its job to regulate this unique state of disaster or, or COVID situation, whatever it is. Um, and so parliament must step up and do its job at this stage. 
So yes, the only thing that's like a slight, and I initially I understood the case like that, but it's clear that HSF have done some thinking about it and they also want to impugn the conduct of the executive. Okay. So they say that to the extent that the executive is involved in the legislative process, so in, in terms of initiating and preparing legislation, they too have failed. Mm -hmm. But their focus is, is on what should be happening in the parliamentary process. Okay. And what we obviously need to understand here is that the members of cabinet are also members of parliament. And in our country, the members of sometimes the same political party. Mm -hmm. And so um, really the reason why most people, although these cases don't say this, why most people are concerned about this is that you have a political party which has decided that a very small group of 20 people in the country will make most of the decisions about the country. Mm -hmm. And they are not doing this through parliament where opposition party members are there. And even if they couldn't successfully vote uh, out a majority decision, they at least can have their say. Um, and so, so what we have here is criticisms of the executive and the legislature because they are acting together in failing to empower parliament to do its job. And some of the remarkable things about what happened with parliament is that when, when this disaster started, parliament went on a three week recess um, which is kind of hard to imagine why they would do that. Mm -hmm. And then still took a long time to start actually doing things. And we're very worried about allowing op cameras in, in, in uh, their sessions and doing things online and all sorts of things. Parliament was essentially very, very slow to do anything. So never mind holding the executive to account for the Disaster Manu Management Act regulations. They started very slowly in doing this. Although you'll see if you go on the parliament website, now portfolio committees have been uh, calling in uh, members of the police, members of the military, government officials to do reports. And so at least we've gotten some public information from there. Uh, mm -hmm. In the papers of these cases, many of the things that are cited for, by the DA and by other applicants to explain what's happening is minutes from parliamentary meetings, because that's the only place that we've been given the information. So the ministers have been willing to tell parliament what they have not disclosed to the public in many instances. Okay, interesting. So this is a real separation of powers case and um, I suppose the legal basis or pathway to review the conduct of parliament and cabinet uh, and, and the, um, at least so the executive and the legislative branch would be legality because it's a, a challenge to public power there's no real question of whether or not the conduct is is administrative in nature. It's it's looking at at the conduct of the legislature and the conduct of of the executive in that sense. Yeah. So uh, they they connect. They can, these cases connect in the sense that they all deal with the exercises of state power, but they all are on different levels and in terms of different arguments. So mm -hmm. this one is very directly separation of powers and about accountability. And in that sense is of interest to administrative law. Uh, the Democratic Alliance one in the Constitutional Court is only a little bit about judicial review uh, for administrative action, which, which you could say in terms of lawfulness and unlawful delegation. And then the other two are very squarely Padger cases. Uh, and the reason why they're very squarely Padger cases is because they deal with the nitty gritty of the regulations and directions. Yeah. I, I would be very surprised if it was determined that the, these regulations and directions weren't all administrative action. Um, so when you're dealing with the detail of them, um, because when you look at the, the, the minutia of detail that is being regulated, to me it seems to be like a cl classic instances of administrative action. Um, but, the problem, but the problem that's faced by people who really have a fundamental problem with the overall approach to the government is challenging specific directions is unrewarding because they can be changed just as they're enacted. Mm. Uh, if you follow the government gazettes, you'll see, you know, the minister of transport sometimes will enact directions one day and then change them the next day. So, so what if you win a judicial review case on that basis, you know, like it's not very satisfying to your fundamental problem, which is how everything is happening. Mm. So we could just quickly point to the, on that there's two issues that arise, two administrative law issues. The one is that although in general it's, it's not permissible for administrators to vary or revoke their decisions, 
for reasons of certainty as an aspect of the rule of law, regulations, as Tim has pointed out, can be varied, that, that there's a, either an implied or an explicit power to, to vary regulations, and, and that's just part of how the state is run, that regulations get updated and changed all the time. Um, but in changing regulations, there can still be, uh, the consequence of changing regulations can still cause a great deal of uncertainty and upheaval and can undermine the rule of law. So that's the one point. And then uh, whilst Tim is fairly confident that the court will find in ESO and the DA's um, high court application that the conduct under scrutiny is administrative action, of course that's um, not something that's entirely clear from the law because in the very first case where the question of whether ministerial regulations are um, administrative action or not, new clicks, the court completely bungled that question and failed to give clear direction. So even as recently as last year in the Stern litigation about regulations to address uh, fracking, we had the court say, well, we don't really know and we don't really care if the creation of regulations is administrative action or not. Um, so there's a good chance in these two cases the courts will adopt that approach of failing to indicate to us it, the basis or pathway for review, failing to identify the correct type of, or at least the type of conduct that is under scrutiny, and then applying the grounds that would, uh, would correctly apply um, based on, on the type of conduct that is under scrutiny in the review proceedings. Um, and that, that could, could be meaningful in the, ESO case in particular where the consultation issue has been very pertinently brought to the fore, where consultation is such an important aspect or requirement or standard of review of, of PUDGE and much less so in, in, the, in the context of review for legality. So those are just some of the, the interesting things that will be if these cases ultimately do get decided and judgments do emerge. We'll, we'll be watching with interest. So one of the reasons, just just uh, to uh, maybe add a point, one of the reasons why I'm a bit more confident about the decisions, that the fact that the decisions will largely be administrative action is that even if you said that the regulations that are passed by the Minister of Cooperative Governance were um, not administrative action, or were maybe agnostic on that view, the directions in terms of those regulations mm -hmm. So we're going one level lower even, right? And saying ministerial directions in terms of regulations, in terms of an act. To me, if the court might ignore the entire question, but if it engages it and decides that this is an administrative action, I'll, I mean, I, 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 will, I can't say that I will be surprised given the fact that there are lots of surprising judgments that come out of courts, but it will be, to me, an indefensible position. Yeah. Yeah, um, I agree. I, I think very much that, these regulations, the making of these regulations is um, administrative action. And also I think that the, um, certainly the making of the directives is administrative action. But um, I mean, we could have a very interesting bet on whether or not the courts got, find that given their tendency to avoid PAJA and avoid deciding that particular question. It's, there's also another interesting question with so many simultaneous cases. So a lot of the time, administrative law takes a long time to develop um, over years. And now you've got a situation where you've got judges all over the country. So put yourself in the position of the high court judges in Gauteng or uh, Western Cape, where they know that the Constitutional Court is currently considering decisions that will have bearing very directly on what they're about to decide. And they could come up with a decision which aspects of it are not correct a day later in terms of a constitutional court decision. It must be quite a scary idea being a high court judge in that situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the courts have a massive role to play right now. There's a lot of pressure on them. I was quite disappointed in the beginning of lockdown with the case, cases that emerged where the courts were very almost timid in wanting to fulfill their judicial review role. Um, of scrutinizing the public power that was happening. 
Um, so we'll see now if further down the line the courts are willing to be a bit more activist and uphold their, their role in the scheme of separation of powers as a check and a balance over um, the conduct of parliament and, and the executive. Yeah, I mean, I think the only thing to say about that is that it's not only in South Africa that this has happened. Um, the, the general trend worldwide has been for the expansion of executive power and for the dilution of both legislative and judicial power, uh, because the legislature have been saying, well, we really don't know what to do, so uh, the executive should act. And court saying, well, we don't want to be the ones to intervene. Uh, but over time, I think that once people settle into the fact that this COVID uh, situation is a reality for a longer period, we hope that, as you say, that courts will be playing the, the bigger role that they really should be paying in ensuring the protection of human rights and ensuring accountability for state action. Great. Um, are there any other last things that you want to discuss? No, uh, uh, un unless you want to talk more admin law. Um, so I suppose you had a, a question on what has COVID-19 shown us about the importance of admin law? Well, we, we, we just discussed this, didn't we? But uh, I mean, I guess that the point is that like, that, that when you are in a situation where there's so many regulations and directions, and when you're in a situation where there's so many exercises of public power that affect our life so directly, mm -hmm. then you understand that the restrictions that are placed in that public power are very important. And sometimes there's a tendency to look at administrative law as about either high profile decisions that happen once in every while of the executive or about, you know, these very scandalous tender cases. Um, but the nuts and bolts of the legal system uh, are administrative decisions and uh, the major form of scrutiny is administrative law. So I guess that that's my feeling on it. I don't yeah. know. And I think then what it, what it shows me for the importance of administrative law, what this crisis has shown me is that um, we are seeing abuses of power and what the admin, what the administrative law does is allow us to have some mechanism in place to hold those abuses of power to account and to, to respond. So if we didn't have these values in our constitution of transparency and openness and the rule of law, and if we didn't have a right to administrative action that is lawful, fair and reasonable and a, a right to request reasons, there's very little we will be able to do in response to what we experience as abuses of power or irrational conduct or unlawful conduct or abdications of power. Um, and so we see that the administrative law has a huge role to play in upholding the separation of powers and upholding the rule of law um, and all of the lawyers that are, are, are bringing these cases are an undoubtedly administrative law um, practitioners, right? They're, there are some of the top advocates in the country who are, are going to be arguing these cases both uh, for the applicants and, and on behalf of the state in response. and um, We'll, we'll see how strong the administrative law holds up, but certainly it has an important role where during apartheid, when there was executive creep, that was the order of the day, right? That was what was supposed to happen, was what was sanctioned. Um, whereas now we, we have some way of saying, well, our scheme of separation of powers doesn't support this and, and some valid legal basis to challenge that, uh, the, these problems that we're seeing. Yeah, and to add to it, I mean, the, the teams of lawyers that, uh, I mean, I think that it's very easy to forget how much work has gone into the government's attempt to build this regulatory system mm -hmm. uh, with directions happening. Every different department must have legal advisors and lawyers drafting language, uh, sometimes well, sometimes not so well. And that, this is one of the reasons why Parliament needs to play a function, because uh, the, the, it, it can't be, no matter how hard we try, that uh, we have to now recreate a whole legal system from scratch and then repeatedly recreate it on an almost daily basis. Mm. Because the cost of that time-wise and uh, 
the number of mistakes that any of us would make if we were doing that, uh, really it's just hard to think about. And that's the reason why democracy is set up the way that it is and why parliament has the function that it is. Um, with 400 people on it who we pay money as taxpayers mm -hmm. to do this job and who are currently not fundamentally doing this job. Yeah, no, I think that's a brilliant point. All right, so uh, this has been um, Dr. Melanie Mercott um, from University of Pretoria, Department of Public Law, um, lecturer in Administrative Law and Environmental Law, speaking about litigation challenging the COVID um, lockdown uh, rules and restrictions. Cool, and uh, I'm Tim Hodgson from the International Commission of Jurists and part-time admin law teacher too. And hopefully this has given you some things to think about and a little better understanding of the relevance of administrative law in COVID-19.